I am so glad you joined me today. We're going to be tackling a rather challenging concept, and that's the idea of bond polarity. So if you have a poles, a polarity in some way, you have some sort of an opposition, a pull, so to speak. So, you know, people are polar opposites. We've got politics right now are very polarizing. You know, people seem to be pulled to one extreme or the other, okay? And that's what we're talking a bit about molecules. In this context, what we're looking at is a separation of charge, a shift in electron density. And for it to make a polar molecule, we need an uneven shift in electron density, and it needs to be permanent, so not temporary. We will talk eventually about temporary shifts. What Right now we're talking about a permanent shift, and it's called a permanent, it results in a permanent dipole moment. It's important to note the word permanent because in another context, but related context, we're going to be talking about temporary dipole moments. Now, a word about electron density or electron distribution. It's like a time averaged picture of where electrons play. So that's very loose language, but I think it gives you an idea that um, you have a bond. In this case, we have hydrogen and fluorine. Fluorine is far more electronegative than hydrogen. I believe hydrogen's right about 2.1. Now, if we could kind of take a picture of where the electrons are playing, those electrons are playing over by the fluorine far more than they are over by the hydrogens. Now, this is a covalent bond. So they haven't abandoned the hydrogen. They're just spending more time over by the fluorine. So at the party, they're nice to hydrogen, but fluorine's just a, a lot more popular guy. And what we end up with then is it's a little bit positive, not fully positive, a little bit and a little bit negative. What can happen then is if we have electrodes here and we charge them, so we have, if you can't see that, that's a negative charge and a positive charge, we know that this permanent dipole moment is real and measurable because the partial positives will align with the negative and the partial negatives line themselves up with the positive. Right? So if I had a molecule like CO2, CO2 has an even distribution, it's nonpolar, it would not align itself. It would just kind of float, didn't matter whether it's off or on, CO2 is just going to kind of float around between those two plates. So let's look at this a little more. One of the things I want to caution you about is molecular polarity is related to bond polarity but cannot be equated with it. So if we want to talk about polarity in general, we have bond polarity and we have molecular polarity. Okay, and, and with bond polarities, we can go all the way to ionic and we can have polar bonds and we can have nonpolar bonds. If we have a diatomic molecule like HF, if the bond is polar, then the molecule is polar because all the molecule is is a bond. So um, its bond polarity does dictate its molecular polarity. But if we get to larger molecules, we're talking about a pull all around a center. So if we have an uneven pull, there's a region where the electron density is higher, we are going to have a polar molecule. So it's possible, and we'll see examples, to have nonpolar bonds 
but a polar molecule. If we have an even pole on a central atom, we're going to have a nonpolar molecule. So we're going to see examples where you can have polar bonds, but a nonpolar molecule because those polar bonds are distributed evenly around a center. So let's take a look at this. We're going to start with nonpolar molecules. Okay, um, if we take a look, I think this will make a little bit more sense. We have here carbon with an electronegativity of 2.5, and we have chlorine with an electronegativity of 3.0. We have four polar bonds. But if you can see, some of you think, well, in vectors, in vectors, there's this even pull. If you have four vectors spaced evenly around a center and they're of the same magnitude, then they cancel one another. Uh, another way you can think of it is it's a, an even pull. It's an identical pull on all around the carbon. And so this actually leads to a nonpolar molecule. So back in the days of Westerns, they used to talk about being drawn and quartered, and it's not the best analogy, but they'd tie horses to your arms and legs and say, giddy up. So this is like having all four stallions that are all the same strength, and they're going to rip the person apart symmetrically. So if you have, what you're looking for is symmetry around that central atom. Now, um, when we have, uh, when we start looking at how molecules are held together, we're going to be looking at weak attractions between neighboring molecules. So these are intermolecular forces that are a whole nother topic, but when we have nonpolar molecules, we have weak attractions between neighboring molecules. Okay, now let's take a look at the next. The properties that this is going to uh, lead to are lower melting points as a generalization, lower melting points, lower boiling points. They're typically going to be liquids or gases at room temperature because it takes less energy to break. It's my highlighter, that's not going to help. Takes less energy to break. Those weaker attractions between neighboring molecules. These do not conduct covalence in general, don't conduct electricity. These are insoluble in water. They would tend to be soluble in other nonpolar solvents. A, a prime example of a nonpolar solvent would be oil. Whoops, not oid. Sorry about that. Oil or gasoline. So oil or gasoline would be nonpolar solvents there. And they exist as discrete molecules with a very fixed beginning and end. Okay. Now, let's take a look at our polar molecules. With polar molecules, if I replaced one of those carbons with a hydrogen, this is really pretty much a nonpolar bond right here. But the point is, is that the chlorine is much more electronegative. So electrons are not only being pulled towards the chlorine, but the carbon is now more electronegative than the hydrogen. So there's all around overall permanent dipole moment where it's partially negative on the chlorine ends and it's partially positive up by the hydrogen end. This would be a tetrahedral if you've seen the Vesper videos. Okay. Now, what this is going to be mean is, is that the attraction between neighboring molecules tends to be stronger. Now, this is assuming similar size. 
because now we have a permanent positive that can be attracted to another permanent negative or a permanent negative that can be attracted to a permanent positive. So we have charge, charge, or partial charge, partial charge, attraction. What this leads to are molecules like water that have much higher melting and boiling points. They're still much lower than ionic. They tend to be liquids at room temperature. They still don't conduct electricity. There's no pathway for electrons. They're typically soluble in polar solvents like water, um, alcohols, small chain, small number of carbons in alcohols because they have an O to an H that make them polar. But they're not soluble in non in nonpolar solvents. And again, very much like the polar, they're molecules. They, there are no ions. They're discrete molecules with a beginning and an end. Three, exactly three chlorines, exactly one hydrogen, exactly one carbon. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of examples where we may have polar bonds, but, and I know this video might run long, so you might want to pause it, but I think it's important to complete this conversation uh, because it is a challenging one. So we talked again, you've got to be careful between polar bonds and polar molecules. So the basic question you want to ask yourself is does the molecule look the same all around the central atom? If the answer is yes, it looks the same, the molecule is nonpolar. So this is just reiterating. So let's look at that example. Let's revisit CO2. Okay, we definitely have a pull of electrons from each towards each oxygen, okay? But since the pull is even, it's an overall nonpolar molecule because there's an even pull. Now, I don't like what I said here, no uneven. Um, I, I prefer there's an even distribution. Um, so there's no permanent dipole moment. Let's look at another one. We saw this example before. This shows it in a different perspective. Um, trying to show three dimensions is this wedge coming out and the dashes. Again, the chlorines do pull electrons towards them. So on a time averaged basis, the electron density is greater by the chlorines. But because it's an even pull within that tetrahedron, this is a nonpolar molecule. Okay, in this case, we have a pull of electron density. We don't have the same thing all around the carbon. This is CH3Cl, and we do have a probably a slight, if I was guessing, woman, permanent dipole moment. Okay, in water. We definitely, one of the things that it's not showing here are these non-bonded electrons. So the oxygen pulls electrons towards it. There's non-bonded electrons there. We have a pull of electrons and a permanent dipole moment. Okay, so again, if it that looks the same, if it's symmetric, it's nonpolar. If it's not symmetric, it's polar. So polar is not symmetric around the central atom, and polar is symmetric around the central atom. Now, if you're in honors, non-bonded pairs typically indicate its polarity. But if you're in AP and IB and college general chemistry, you can't say that. You're going to come across molecules where the electron pairs cancel one another. So be really cautious with that. You really start to have to envision in three dimensions uh, whether or not non-bonded pairs of electrons cancel. In oxygen, they don't because they're kind of coming up and out like that. Those pairs would be, I, don't, I shouldn't use the lines, but I'm trying to give you an idea that they're not opposite one another. Okay, so, okay, hopefully that helps you out with polarity. It was a little long, but I really appreciate your patience.
with a very challenging concept. Have a great day.